Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody who has um, stuck around through the end of the conference on this beautiful day. I hope this has been a, a, uh, as good a learning experience for you as it has been for me. Um, I want to make sure to thank the folks at the Seattle Science Foundation and Swedish CME, but especially Giselle Mitchell for making this conference happen. This has been uh, um, a really fun experience, our first virtual day-long CME. Um, right now we're going to do um, take a few minutes to do a um, last minute review um, of key learning points from each of the talks. Um, if this works as expected, you'll get a chance to uh, do a little poll to um, test your answers. Okay, hang on a sec. Okay, so the first question, um, under new guidance from the Biden administration, what is the minimum uh, providers must do in order to be able to prescribe buprenorphine to patients with opiate use disorder? So complete an eight hour training, work in a clinic with integrated psychosocial services, complete a notice of intent on the SAMHSA website, have a valid DEA number and medical license and receive their X waiver number or any provider is able to prescribe buprenorphine for any reason now. Okay, well. Okay, let's uh, see what the answer is. It looks like everybody got this right. Um, the answer is uh, C. And hopefully you all have the QR code to sign up to uh, get your notice of intent. All right, next question. All right, next question. Hang on a sec, a little technical problem here. I don't know if I am helping. There we, there we go. Okay. okay. All right. Sorry about that. Under the new guidance from the, wait a minute, we were, we were, we've lost a question here. Hang on a sec. Under new guidance from the Biden administration. No, wait. All right. Hang on a sec. Okay. Sorry. We're having a little technical trouble.
Maureen, we're happy to share the slides if that's easier. All right, sorry about that. We're gonna try this one more time. Um, Which of the following are proven effects of safe injection sites? Um, increased crime in the surrounding neighborhood, reduced HIV transmission, reduced deaths, or increased uptake of treatment services? And you can answer uh, more than one. All right, let's take a look at the answers. It looks like uh, it looks like a good uh, good audience response. So the second, third, and fourth are all um, correct answers. Okay. Based on data from multi-state Medicaid enrollees initiating buprenorphine treatment for opiate use disorder, which of the following was a risk factor for buprenorphine early discontinuation? Psychiatric comorbidities, an initial dose of less than four milligrams per day, an initial prescription of 14 or more days, or fee-for-service insurance. Okay, let's check the answer. And, and almost all of you got that uh, correct. The initial dose of less than or equal to four milligrams per day was the biggest risk factor for buprenorphine early discontinuation. Okay, with uh, what is one possible technique you could use to reinforce sobriety during a brief intervention? Replace harmful behaviors with behaviors that are mundane and have little meaning. Actively identify and send back narratives that sustain current behavior. Uh, educate and provide resources that help patients navigate harmful urges or behaviors in parallel instead of fighting them or giving in or do nothing because brief interventions have no efficacy. And the correct answer, let's see what people thought. <laughs> Excellent job. Correct answer is educate and provide resources.
which of the following statements are true about buprenorphine microdosing induction protocols? Uh, microdosing inductions can be safely completed in both inpatient and outpatient settings. B, microdosing is a less patient-centered approach than standard induction protocols. C, withdrawal symptoms and microdosing inductions may be managed by up, -tit up titrating a patient's full agonist opioid. Or D, um, answers both A and C. Let's see what people are, are uh, thinking is the right answer. Excellent. Uh, the correct answer is uh, both one and three. Let's see, the following is true about treatment for Kratom de dependence. Um, A, no current treatment strategies have been observed. B, suboxone induction has shown promise in case studies. C, use of benzodiazepines has been studied in Kratom withdrawal. Or D, naltrexone is a common treatment strategy. All right, let's see, uh, let's see how people are doing. Yes, the boxone induction has shown promise in case studies. Of the following, which benzodiazepine would be the only one expected to show up on a routine office immunoassay? A, alprazolam, B, clonazepam, C, diazepam, or D, lorazepam. This is a reminder that the immunoassays are limited for benzodiazepines. Okay, let's take a look at the answer. And the correct answer is in fact diazepam. Okay, methamphetamine use and deaths in Washington state increased fourfold between 2008 and 2016. Which of the following would not be recommended for treatment of methamphetamine use disorder based on current evidence? Naloxone, bupropion and naltrexone combination, mirtazapine, Adderall, or referral to matrix counseling. Which one is not effective? All right, let's take a look at the answer. Exactly, 100% correct. Sorry, sorry, this is a, a, a slow process. Which of the following is not a known side effect of chronic nitrous oxide, also known as whippet usage? Parkinsonism, polyneuropathy, megaloblastic anemia, white matter dementia, or psychosis? Which one is not a side effect of chronic nitrous oxide usage? Let's check the answer. That's a kind of a split decision on this, but the correct answer is in fact Parkinsonism. C, 
seen with hydrocarbon and, and toluene, but not nitrous oxide. You might ask if the Seattle Science Foundation can take over the, um, the slides. Our, our internet connection has slowed down enough that, that it's not working well on this side. Not a problem, we can do that. Okay, which of the following is not a benzodiazepine withdrawal symptom? Muscle cramps, rhinorrhea, insomnia, anxiety, or irritability? Which of these is not a benzodiazepine withdrawal symptom? All right, let's take a look at the answer. Yeah, and the answer is rhinorrhea, um, not associated with benzodiazepine withdrawal. Okay, next question. Which of the following is false regarding alcohol use in older adults? Um, older adults are less likely to be screened for unhealthy alcohol use than younger adults. Number two, for healthy adults over the age of 65, not on any medications, exceeding four drinks a day or 14 drinks per week is not recommended. Now, Trexone is recommended and well tolerated pharmacological intervention for relapse prevention in older adults, or the MAST-G is the first instrument designed specifically to screen for alcohol use disorder in older adults. Which of these is false? Let's take a look at the answer. Great, 63% of you got that one right. Um, for healthy adults over the age of 65, uh, exceeding three drinks a day or seven drinks per week is not recommended. The next question, which of the following medications does not have sufficient evidence to be used as monotherapy for alcohol withdrawal management? per the ASAM 2020 clinical practice guidelines, which does not have sufficient evidence, gabapentin, valproic acid, diazepam, or carbam <laughs> carbamazepine. Let's take a look at the answer. Great, yeah, valproic acid is, is the correct answer. Okay, next question. You guys are doing great. According to observational studies, what is the most common method of contraception chosen by people who use drugs currently? Uh, OCPs, IUDs, condoms, or fertility awareness? Which is the most common method of contraception? Let's take a look at that answer. Excellent, condoms is the correct answer. Okay. Now, how would you approach treating an adolescent with smartphone addiction? Number one, by respecting the adolescent's autonomy and let them continue with their current use. 
That's the adolescent's preferred answer. Um, number two, encourage abstinence and use of non-smartphone devices for communication. Number three, with compassion, promoting them to keep to a schedule and offering alternative activities. Or number four, send them to military school so they could learn some respect. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, now the final question, which of the following is true? Number one, OTPs offer methadone but not buprenorphine for opiate use disorder. Number two, a postpartum person who started using heroin 10 months ago is a good candidate to refer for methadone maintenance therapy. Number three, Methadone will only be started at an OTP if a person is showing signs of opioid withdrawal. Number four, it is standard practice to reduce a person's methadone dose to 30 milligrams if they miss more than four consecutive doses. Which one of those following is true? Only one. Excellent. Um, so the correct answer, methadone will only be started at an OTP if a person is showing signs of opioid withdrawal. So um, great job audience and thank you again so very much for um, coming to the R3 talks this year. And uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully in person a year from now. Many, many, many thanks to our wonderful speakers.